Hey guys, so when I was a young lad I managed to purchase this uh, this beauty for about, well I think it was about four pounds. Uh, that to be fair was about 40 years ago, um, so uh, not, not the kind of price you pay these days. But it started off my love of skulls uh, as a young boy. Um, <laughs> I was into my metal music, my heavy rock, so I also was exposed to a lot of skulls in the album covers and the general artwork with that. But in more recent years, over the last few years, um, I returned to, to uh, that, that love of collecting skulls. And I've done that from what I find uh, in Roadkill and out in the in Woodland Walks. And um, so that's what I've got here. I'm pretty much only really interested in the skulls. But what happens is you will tend to collect a lot of um, bones, unwanted bones, not so much unwanted, but they're, they're the bones that I'm not as interested in, um, in, per in terms of display. So this video is about how to use real bones in your terrain build, which is my throne of bone, which you have already seen the pedestal that that stands on. However, what I want to cover first is what you do with the bones or the roadkill that you find so that you can make your bones sterile and long lasting so that you can get decades and decades without anything going wrong. <laughs> so let's do this. Hey guys. So, uh, the very first step we want to take in this hobby is how we let nature do its part without nature getting in the way. So, for nature to do its part, we need to be able to let the decomposers and the detrivores get to the, uh, the, the dead animal that we want to get the bones from. Now, the mo one of the most effective ways we can do that is by burying them in the ground. The problem with burying in the ground is it can get a lot messier. It can be difficult to find the bones because they uh, shift as the uh, microbiome does its job. And I've lost animals in the past that way. Um, but there's also the danger that something else will dig it up. So unless you can contain it in some way in the ground, my preferred uh, method is above ground. Now if it's a small animal, um, one of the most effective uses I have are two standard just gardening pots. If you have ceramic ones, they can be better because they're heavier. Uh, and you basically place the animal inside one, you cap it off, seal it up with another, and then you just put this somewhere out of sight and out of mind for a few months uh, especially in the first couple of weeks because you'll have a couple of days uh, where there is a gas release which can smell quite a lot um, now what this does is because there are holes here this allows the detrivores to be able to get in there and start doing their job now you could indeed put a small amount of soil in this as well and I have done that um, which uh, allows a, a smaller microbiology to, to get to into the the carcass uh, but this um, this this is my my method is this now so for something bigger you obviously need bigger containers um, but it's not often that that happens uh, in that sense well you, what you want to do is make sure that this goes somewhere that other wildlife can't get to and get open. So for that, I use one of these. So this is one of the big old uh, plastic uh, refuse containers. Um, I like these because they have a lockable lid with a sort of a clip so that that lid won't come off. Uh, uh, until you prise open the clips and then it comes off. 
And then inside here, I've got my various containers that are currently doing their job. And I can already see small flies and whatever coming out of here. Uh, that may not be picked up on the camera. So in here, I have um, a, a few containers uh, that uh, contain um, some carcasses. So here we go. Uh, that's done quite well. This has literally only been in here two or three weeks. So you can see the process is quite fast. There is already bone structure uh, exposed here. Uh, and this one has been here for quite a number of weeks now uh, so he's probably uh, still got quite a ways to go there's a lot of fur uh, to deal with there um, so I will uh, I will leave that in there for now um, so there are a few tools you need to think about um, when you are gonna enter into this um, hobby uh, you need to make sure that your hands stay as clean as possible so I wear uh, rubber gloves and I also have anti-back uh, wipe for my hands uh, when I'm finished. <clears throat> you will need um, some uh, biological uh, washing powder, uh, not the non-bio, it must be biological um, as it says here. It's, it has to be biological so that it can deal with the biology in the bones, that microbial biology. Uh, you're going to need a container in which to uh, put the, uh, the, the roadkill effectively once it's gone through the uh, natural decomposition stage. Um, this is the fir used in the first step. This isn't necessarily a requirement but a muslin net is, or a muslin bag is, can be useful so that you can just catch all of the small parts, you'd be surprised how small some of those bones are. And if you're using those, the bones in terrain, the smaller bones are actually uh, most useful in actual fact. Um, the one sort of more expensive bit that you need to get hold of, and that might be problematic depending on where you are, it shouldn't be, it is a food grade hydrogen peroxide. Uh, which is used in the later stages of the cleaning uh, which will help to bleach the bones and finally you're going to want um, a container that you can use to put the effective waste into um, ready for disposal now I dispose of mine in uh, I have a woodland at the back here so I, I'm able to just uh, take it there and empty it out you may need to look for alternative methods um, but the woodland provides me the opportunity to just give it sort of back to nature as it were. The only bit I don't actually dispose of into any woodland or anything is the hydrogen peroxide mix. Uh, but that's a secondary stage so that doesn't really get involved here at these early stages. So after nature has taken its course and rid you of most of the biological material, um, that's when we can start uh, stopping the process and uh, that's what we need the biological powder for now unfortunately there's no governance on how long nature is going to take to finish its job as you've just seen uh, and I had hoped that one of those would actually be ready for purposes of this part of the video however I can still show you the process so we need to take one of our tubs and into that we're going to put a generous amount, and I mean a generous amount, of uh, the biological powder. Into that we would place our bones, whatever is left. Um, there may still be elements of fur, there may still be a feather, um, but you want most of that to have gone at this point. Uh, you want mostly exposed bone at this point, um, as this is more to deal with the microbiology rather than actually trying to break down uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fleshy tissue that's still left. And once the bones are in there, uh, we fill that uh, with water making sure that it's fully submerged. We seal that up 
in a, a watertight and preferably airtight uh, tub. We give that a real good shake and for this we really want to shake it up so that that, uh, uh, that powder is fully uh, um, dissolved into the liquid and also to make sure that the uh, liquid is agitated right into the uh, bone structures. Uh, now this has to be left for I would say at least two to three weeks. I generally leave it for a month to six weeks uh, before I move on to the next step. So I'm pretty sure you've already figured it out. This is not a hobby for the faint-hearted. It is not a. These steps are definitely not pleasant steps to take, and um, I'm sure you can already guess by looking at this tub that it can be pretty. Um, pretty gross so uh, if you're not up for gross uh, watching gross things it's probably as well to uh, turn away and just listen to the audio maybe um, so this is an airtight sealable uh, tub uh, airtight because obviously there are gases and whatever building um, <clears throat> which is what results in the smell so an airtight tub uh, reduces the, the smell element and as you can see it gets pretty gunky uh, in here everything needs to be scrubbed down afterwards uh, because this is all of the biological material being um, broken down uh, by the uh, the bio powder and now um, it's been a while since uh, I've actually been into this uh, this pot so I'm not a hundred percent sure what's there so you can see this already had a uh, was in a muslin bag and this is a fresh muslin bag for me to pour this sort of uh, slurry through because I can't recall what's actually in this um, what's in this container here so it's just going to allow me to catch there we go the smaller stuff that's there I can see a couple of small skulls so it's probably uh, rats that's one of my main things here unfortunately I don't get anything bigger than that okay so as I said not a job for the kitchen table so here we have a collection of uh, bones uh, there's a couple of few small skulls in there um, that I've obviously uh, put together all in the one bag uh, so those will go on to the next step um, let's remind myself now what's in this bag um, I've got a feeling this was a bird, maybe. Okay, so this is a bigger, bigger pile of bones. Okay. So here we go. I can't remember what this was actually off. This may well have been. Here we go. Here's the, here's the skull by the looks of it. I think this was a cat, actually. Yeah, here we go. Here's so. Here's the uh, the skull, and it looks pretty grim right now. Here's the lower jaw. One of the beauties of uh, collecting uh, your own uh, skulls is you get both parts. Whereas when you tend to buy them, you'll only get the upper part. And if you're really lucky, this jaw, the ligaments won't have broken down entirely, and the jaw will stay attached to the skull. And so that's actually cleaned up pretty well. Sometimes there's, a, there's still a fur especially can be attached uh, in there. So <clears throat> next step is to just give these a bit of a, a washing over. So you need um, access to water, whether you bring that as a tub, a jug. I've got a tap here with a hose, which is what I'm going to put on now. There we go. What I'm going to do is just lift that bag up and just wash the majority of the sludge and the slurry off there into my container okay and the uh, same again with these little guys here Okay, 
that's cleaned them down quite a bit. Yep. So that's cleaned most of the uh, the sludge and the slurry off here. Um, that's a great looking school that is. Okay, so I've got a, a second uh, tub here now that's uh, mostly filled with just plain water and into that I'm going to place all of the bones. So that it can go through the second stage. And it's these little bones that will get caught down in the bottom of this muslin, which is what your, you know, where some of your main main uh, options for terrain will be. And these little skulls that I've got in here as well, I'm just going to pop into here to go along with this. Some of these can be extremely delicate, so you know. Especially when you're looking at a tiny bird skull uh, like uh, like this, and settle all that down. You want to try and make sure that there's no like here. This skull is a bit bigger, so you want to make sure that there's nothing exposed like that. Some of these smaller bits they'll just move around over time when you give it a shake, um, but um, a big bit like that, even the shaking isn't going to going to. Put it in there, so I'm just going to top that up. There we go. Okay, now it's going to float a bit because it's full of air. Um, but this is where now we want the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, all I'm going to do is just pour an amount of that, a small amount, just to make sure that there's a bleaching agent in there, in the bones. Okay, now I'm going to seal this up. I'm going to give it a good shake, make sure that hydrogen peroxide is well mixed and it's going around there. This is a watertight tub, uh, airtight so nothing's going to come out of there and then I'm going to set that aside for well at least a couple of weeks uh, to get that uh, to get that bleaching uh, then it's time to clean up um, and that that's pretty much it okay guys so uh, once uh, a few weeks has passed by um, in that final tub mix with the hydrogen peroxide you can take the bones out and place them on a sunny windowsill for a day or two. So you'll end up with your uh, nicely bleached bones that are going to be quite suitable for display. However, whatever you choose, whether that's terrain or just putting on display. And, um, and without anything biological happening in the years to come, they will be perfectly fine and are uh, safe to handle. So you may want to just check your local authority to make sure that you are okay for collecting uh, roadkill off uh, of, of an actual road. Um, so be aware that you uh, can be breaking the law. Uh, so read that as you will. I do have to apologise for the lighting on this section, but it does improve in a moment. Anyway, I had a reasonable idea of what I already wanted to create in terms of this uh, bone throne. Uh, but this was for a competition, so it had to fit on this 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre square. Um, that obviously escalated out as, the, uh, as that part of the build um, progressed. So the putting together of the bones was a fairly straightforward process just super gluing them as I say I'd already figured out which bones I wanted to use and uh, super gluing them together worked out really really well. So the actual design here is I wanted this sort of three spired large gigantic throne made of uh, real bones. Um, 
and it's kind of a, I think it's a spinal piece that actually creates the seat and, and was a perfect stand for this to stand of its own accord without any kind of basing. It was great. I was really, really pleased. Now, the theme for the Encounter Terrain competition was uh, uh, left and repurposed. So what I wanted to, was the idea that these bones came from some gigantic beast and a powerful leech lord of some description had had his slaves uh, lash these bones together to form this mighty throne that would strike fear into the hearts of those adventurers that found it. So right now what I'm doing is I'm actually just wrapping and gluing string around the bones to improve the bond and the strength of those connections and uh, they get painted up as just old rope uh, later on. Now it's curious that despite all of the earlier part of this demo uh, of getting these bones to this lovely pristine bleach look that I now actually want to paint them to look like they did when I first had them originally uh, which is uh, old and weathered and worn and uh, quite grubby. So I'm mixing here Vallejo's Beastly Brown with just a little bit of black just to dirty it somewhat. Um, and I'm applying this pretty much as a very thin wash, which I also then water down once the thicker paint is put on there. This creates the uh, a difference in consistency in the paint, which will lead to a, a slightly muckier finish. Uh, and it allows for a, a certain degree of stain marks to happen, which I felt was quite important to give that look of age. Once that was finished and dried, I have to say I lost a bit of footage uh, with me painting the ropes a sort of a brownish colour, still dirty though. And I did also give the bones a highlight of bone white uh, just to pull out some edges again. Uh, and this was the uh, final look. I was super pleased. <laughs>